Frank Bookman was an American college chaplain from Pennsylvania who, in the 1920s and 30s, played a prominent role in developing the work of the Oxford Group, which later became known as Moral Rearmament. The group sought to recapture the spirit of primitive or first century Christianity and was focused on university students and graduates. It was also thought that association with the name Oxford would give it readier social acceptance. The movement was non-denominational and among other features that it emphasised were informal joyous fellowship and the change to a truly Christian moral life. This meant that abandoning alcohol became something more positive than mere absence of alcohol or dryness. They also laid great store by surrender, by seeking God's guidance, and by the giving of oneself in service to others. Among those who embraced the new faith and confessed an obsession with alcohol was Ebby T, who had already been committed or institutionalized. In the euphoria of his newfound sobriety, he visited his hopelessly afflicted friend, Bill W, in New York in 1934, and tried to convey the message to him. But pride in his own rational and inquiring mind led Bill to reject Ebby as a religious crackpot. And it was only after two more periods under the care of Dr Silkworth at Towns Hospital that Bill finally surrendered. Ultimately, Bill resumed his work as a market analyst for a firm of stockbrokers. This, in due course, took him to Akron, Ohio, and the Mayflower Hotel. There he experienced a business reversal or setback, and that night he was starkly confronted with a choice between drinking in the bar or phoning up to find someone in the area with an alcohol problem. The Reverend Tunks, a minister in the Akron area, told Bill about the work of Henrietta Sieberlin, who was vainly trying to wean a local doctor off the bottle. The addicted physician was Dr Bob S, and Henrietta arranged a meeting between Bill and Dr Bob at the gatehouse her home on the Siebeling estate. After this meeting, on May the 12th, 1935, Dr. Bob gradually sobered up, and June the 10th, the date of his last drink, is generally regarded as the founding, by these two men, of what became the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. During the late 30s, for a variety of reasons, it was decided to commit to paper the programme of Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps and the stories and experiences of the first hundred alcoholics. The outcome was the publication in 1939 of the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous. That edition was deliberately bulky in volume and was immediately identified as the big book, but formally entitled Alcoholics Anonymous. And from this title, the fellowship ultimately took its name. During the ensuing year, the fellowship grew slowly but steadily until on March the 1st, 1941, the Saturday Evening Post published Jack Alexander's perceptive and sympathetic article, which had an immediate and immense effect. And by the end of 1941, membership had soared to 8,000, compared with some 2,000 the previous year.
Another significant event following the publication of the big book in America was the article in Liberty magazine entitled Alcoholics and God by Fulton Ausler, who later, as a writer and editor of religious articles, travelled to London with his wife Grace, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Despite post-war austerity, England in particular was still rebuilding its infrastructure. Nevertheless, a few letters in 1945 and 46 were getting through to the Alcoholic Foundation in New York. These 12-step inquiries were, in 1947, acted upon by Grace contacting Canadian Bob, who had joined AA in America in August 1945, but was now living in Kew. Bob took Grace and her husband Fulton for lunch at a Hungarian restaurant in Soho, at which the Auslers offered their room at the Dorchester for a meeting the following Monday. This meeting took place at 8pm on the 31st of March 1947 in room 202. Present were Grace, Bob, Chris, Vernon and Pat G, whom Grace had met aboard the Cunada when she had advertised a meeting for Friends of Bill W. Norman R. W. was present, though at that time much the worse for wear. He demanded a large gin and vermouth, an order which was quickly countermanded by Grace to the waiter, and subsequently Norman walked out, but remained in the hotel lobby. Canadian Bob recalled the meeting. It was Grace O. who really triggered off the inception of AA in England. She had written to me before she and her husband Fulton embarked at New York on one of the Queens. During lunch in London, Grace, her husband and I mapped out on a Saturday plans for a meeting the following Monday. Eight of us met in her hotel room the last night of March 1947, and the five Londoners chose me as secretary. This hotel room meeting is generally accepted as the first AA meeting to take place in Great Britain, although there is reference to some form of meeting in London in 1946 in letters supplied by GSO in New York. After that Dorchester meeting, three of the group met at the Dominion Theatre Café, where they agreed to meet regularly in the home of Canadian Bob at Mortlake Road, Kew. Canadian Bob recalls, I would watch the approach to our house on meeting nights and what a switch from trepidation to a happy glow when three, four or even six hove in sight a quarter of a mile away. During this time, the group worked hard visiting hospitals and treatment centres and it was decided to advertise the existence of AA in the national press. All the national daily newspapers prevaricated except the Financial Times. This first example of public information, placed by Bob and those early AA members in the Financial Times, was published as follows on the 9th of June, 1947. Alcoholism. A small body of anonymous ex-sufferers place themselves at the disposal of any who require help. The offer is quite gratuitous. A deluge of responses was awaited. There were two enquiries as the result of this tentative public information approach. An article in the Leader magazine gave a positive response to AA. However, in 1948, an article in the Sunday Dispatch garnered 25 enquiries. And in April 1949, a Beverly Nichols article on AA in the Sunday Chronicle started a steady stream. This was in addition to the articles published by the medical profession in The Lancet in 1947 and 48, raising the profile of AA in Britain. Members continued to meet regularly and in autumn 1948, the group named itself the First London Group and began to hold the majority of meetings in the upstairs boardroom of the Medical Society at 11 Shandos Street, Cavendish Square. By the mid-1950s, 
the group had published the first Great Britain pamphlet on AA and moved to a venue in Portman Square. A record of group minutes reveals the struggles of this first group as there was a high turnover of officers, particularly secretary and treasurer. Two of the earliest pieces of AA memorabilia relating to London meetings are to be found in the Fellowship's archives. Firstly, the coffee pot, donated by a Dublin member to the London Sunday Club on the occasion of its fifth anniversary in September 1957. Secondly, the plaque brought to England by Vernon W. from the Bermuda Group. In January 1949, a group of members produced the first monthly newsletter. This first print run consisted of 25 stenciled copies and gave notice of an open meeting to be held in February of that year. Over the years, Newsletter adopted several formats. Canadian Bob made two significant 12-step contacts, both of whom had a strong influence on the development of AA in Great Britain. The first one, Bill H., was, by 1948, an active AA member who had business premises in the London Fruit Exchange. In August of that year, he volunteered one of the rooms as an AA service office. This became the first location of the London Telephone Service and the first AA telephone helpline in Great Britain with the number BIS4980. Bob's second crucial contact was with Alan of Bolton and his wife Winnie. The couple were affectionately designated by Bob as the Bolton Group. Alan was instrumental in much of the development of AA in the north of England, as Canadian Bob recalls. At one time in England, Alan was responsible for the 12-step work anywhere north of Golders Green. In Manchester, Alan brought together a group of five who held their first formal meeting in the lounge of the Millgate Hotel in November 1948, concluding with a gentleman's agreement to stay sober until their next meeting following the Christmas break. They were able to do this and AA began to spread in the north of England. Back in London, Lottie T took over secretarial duties, whilst Canadian Bob's work had taken him to northern Rhodesia. Some meetings were held in Lottie's flat in St John's Wood, and Norman R. W., last heard of asking for a gin and vermouth at the Dorchester, was the sober chairman at these meetings. Lottie was a very skilled cartoonist, and many of her cartoons reflected her recovery in AA, and one, in particular, she sent to Bill W. on behalf of the first British AA group, and now it hangs in the archives of GSO in New York. As well as Lottie acting as secretary and making strenuous attempts to obtain literature from New York in the teeth of obstruction from hard-pressed wartime customs officers, an AA service structure was taking shape and the advisory committee of four members was formed in the early months of 1948. By October 1949, the advisory committee of group leaders was deemed inappropriate and instead became the group representative committee. This group delegated responsibility for the publishing of newsletter and management of the service office in London to the Central Committee. Outside London, by 1949, several groups had become established in Brighton, Bolton, Manchester, Liverpool, and at Mickleton in Gloucestershire. By the end of 1950, several more groups had opened along the south coast, and by the end of 1951, London's meetings had increased to nine, 
along with meetings opened in other cities such as Birmingham and Cheltenham. This growth continued throughout England in the 50s and by 1959 there were 17 meetings in London, 15 in the home counties, 5 in Wales and 52 in the rest of England. An event which stimulated this early growth was the visit of our co-founder Bill W and his wife Lois, who in the summer of 1950 toured groups in England and Scotland. Following this, Bill presented Great Britain with 1,500 copies of the 14th printing of the first edition of the Big Book from the American Alcoholic Foundation. One of Bill and Lois's meetings was with Bill H. at his fruit exchange office. It was Bill H. who was referred to in AA Comes of Age as an integral member to the growth of AA in Great Britain. To manage distribution and income from the sales of these big books, a separate pre-foundation committee was formed in 1952. Five of the very early pioneers of AA in Britain managed the finances of this gift. Bill W. had waived his right to any royalties. This group became the forerunner of the General Service Board, who then progressed to publishing and distributing AA literature in Great Britain. In 1953, this committee was incorporated as the Al-Anon Publishing Company and duly registered but later, after a request from the Al-Anon Fellowship, changed its name to AA Sterling Area Services, which then began to distribute AA literature worldwide within the Pound Sterling area. The demands of a growing fellowship in the 50s were putting undue strain on the Fruit Exchange Service Office, and in 1952, the Central Committee took out a lease on 11 Redcliffe Gardens, London South West 10. This remained the focal point for AA services until 1986, when the General Service Office was relocated to Stonebow House, York. In 1954, Great Britain published a first edition of the Big Book. This carried an additional paragraph to the foreword thanking the Alcoholic Foundation of New York for its support. On a personal level, a signed copy was gifted to Bill W, and this now resides in the AA archives in New York. In returning the gesture, Bill gifted signed copies of the first printing of the second edition to those signatories and many more AA members in Great Britain. Throughout the 1950s, the collective AA decision-making process was mainly through AA conventions. The first took place in England at the Bellevue